In chapter 3, we're going to talk about the mass relationships and chemical reactions, also known as stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is one thing that you cannot just watch a video and say, I know it, or watch a lecture and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Stoichiometry is something that has to be practiced. This is a very, very important skill. Matter of fact, probably one of the most crucial skills in chemistry after naming. So, first we're going to start off with the atomic mass. Uh, the mass of an element is given by the atomic mass unit, or the AMU. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of why we have different units, uh, but suffice to say that uh, we can measure the mass to charge ratio of small particles um, using something known as a mass spectrometer. Um, now, the takeaway from this is that the periodic table gives you an average value for the mass in AMUs of the element. Now, notice these are not whole numbers. These are fractions. This is based on what we call isotopic abundance. The isotopic abundance is actually a weighted average of the masses of different isotopic fractions. So, it is the sum, that's what the sigma means, of the isotopic mass times its fractional abundance. As I said, this is a weighted average. This is exactly how I calculate your grades, as a weighted average. So you can see, for carbon, there are two major isotopes. There is a third, but two major isotopes. Uh, carbon-12, which composes 98.9% of all the carbon you see, and carbon-13, which is about 1.1%. There is a very small fraction of carbon-14. Uh, so what we would do is we would take the atomic mass in AMUs, so like the 13, in carbon-13, and we will multiply by the fraction of the abundance, so 1.10% as a decimal. And we would add that to the carbon-12 times the 98.9% as a decimal. And that would give us our average atomic mass, roughly about 12.01 AMUs. So let's work through an example of how to calculate the average atomic mass for my favorite element, gymnasium. Okay, this is obviously a fictional element, but gymnasium has three major isotopes. Gymnasium 352, which has a mass of 351.5 AMUs and an abundance of 22.13%. Now, first thing you should note is that the mass and atomic mass units does not need to be, nor will it often be, an integral value. That is, uh, it is not going to be a whole number. Uh, the reason for this is there are slight defects in the way we calculate AMUs, and when an atom comes together, what holds the nucleus together is a binding energy. Now, that energy comes from the conversion of a small amount of mass into energy, so non-integral mass numbers. Uh, so we have gymnasium 352, gymnasium 354, and you can read the percent abundance and the AMUs, and gymnasium 355 with that mass and that percent abundance. And our job is to calculate the average atomic mass for gymnasium. So the first thing we should do is we should write out all of our atomic mass units and our percent abundances. First step in problem solving is always writing down what do you know. So here are all of our atomic mass units and our percent abundances. So to calculate the average atomic mass, remember this is the sum of the mass times the percent abundance or the mass fraction. Okay, so we're going to take our 355, three, uh, sorry, 351 point five times the 22.13 percent, but I want this to be a fraction or a decimal, so 0 0.2213, and I'm going to add the 357, uh, 353.7 times 61.01 again as a decimal, 0 0.6101 plus the final is the 354.9 times 0.1686. And when I perform this calculation, I get an answer of 353.41546. That's what my calculator says. Now, I should have how many sig figs? Well, I've got four sig figs here and four sig figs here. 
four here, four here, four here, four here. Now, this is where it gets complicated. When I take a look at the individual steps uh, of my multiplication, so the multiplication is four sig figs, but then what's going to rule my number of sig figs is the addition step, because the addition is done after the multiplication. So the first step here gives us 77.79. The second step here gives us 215.8 uh, in four sig figs and 59.84 in the last. Now what's neat about this is since this is our controlling factor, only one decimal place, we actually still end up with only four sig figs. So our answer should be 353.4 AMUs. Now we need to make sure, does this make sense? So 353.4, well, <clears throat> we know that the biggest abundance of mass unit was in 353.7. Um, so there's, that our number should be really close to the 353.7. There's a small amount of difference between the lower mass number of 351.5 and 354.9. So this number actually makes pretty darn good sense. All right, the next big concept we're going to cover is the mole. Now, the mole comes from the work of a gentleman named Amadeo Avogadro, and you can see his really uh, kind of a only the mother could love face uh, right there. Kind of an ugly dude, but he was uh, an Italian scientist, and what he did is he worked with gases, and he came up with what is known as Avogadro's Law, that combining one volume of a gas, any gas, at the same temperature and pressure with the same volume of any other gas at the same temperature and pressure will yield double that volume. In other words, if you have twice the amount of crap, you need twice the space to store it in. Pretty sensible. Okay? Uh, now, he didn't actually come up with the concept of the mole. This came actually after his death. Um, but it is probably one of the most, well, it is the most central concept to all of chemistry. Uh, without the mole, we could not do much of the work we do because we cannot count atoms. We count particles by mass. So what, the, what we do is we use the mole to count particles, okay? So one mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd parts per mole. That's the mole to the negative one. Notice there is no numerator unit. This allows us to put whatever we want in the numerator. Okay, so this is a really, really, really gigantically enormous number. Uh, it is such a big number that we have a hard time uh, understanding the size of this number. And so we've got a couple of things that we can do to try to help understand the enormity. The first is what we call the green pea analogy. If we were to have one mole, that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, average green peas, little green peas like you would buy in the store, it would cover the earth to a depth of one mile, and it would take five earths to come up with that many peas. So that's a lot of peas. Additionally, you can think of it this way. If we were to start counting every tenth of a second since the start of the Big Bang, we would be only three quarters of the way through counting the Avogadro's number. So, pretty darn large number, but it works because atoms are extremely small. So as I said, what Avogadro's number does for us is it allows us to take the microscopic, or really the submicroscopic, and relate it to the macroscopic world, the things that we see. Since atoms are tiny, Avogadro's number needs to be really, really big. Okay? And n sub a is our abbreviation for Avogadro's number. Now, again, I'm going to skip the derivation in terms of understanding. Is What we did was we set a standard, okay? and that is what we call the carbon-12 definition. This standard says that one mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, atoms of isotopically pure carbon-12, okay? so that's weighing 12 AMUs, will weigh exactly 12 grams, okay? So what that does is it allows us to set the masses on the periodic table that are given in AMUs. Now, it allows us to bring that into the, the macroscopic world in terms of the units grams per mole. So 12.01 g 
grams per mole of carbon is what's listed on the periodic table. That means that if I have one mole of any carbon, it's going to weigh 12.01 grams. Now, as I said, this allows us to count by weight. So, the jelly bean analogy. Um, if you were working in a candy store and somebody said, I want exactly 1,000 jelly beans, are you going to sit there and count up 1,000 jelly beans? No, you're going to weigh a jelly bean and then multiply by 1,000. But that's actually not even a, a good way to do it because we really should weigh an average of jelly beans because not every jelly bean is made the same. So we should weigh out maybe 10 jelly beans and then multiply by 100. So really Avogadro's number is allowing us to count vast numbers of particles through the weight in grams. Now, there's also what I call the jelly bean, jelly bean and mint analogy. So if a jelly bean, say, weighs 5 grams and a mint weighs 15 grams, so good old starburst mints there. Uh, if you wanted a thousand jelly beans, you would weigh out five thousand grams. If you wanted a thousand mints, you would weigh out one thousand five hundred, uh, sorry, fifteen thousand uh, grams of mints. Now that ratio of mass is actually what allows us to understand the law of constant composition. The ratio of fifteen grams of mints to five grams of jelly bean is a constant ratio, three to one. So that is how we can determine the actual formulas of molecules or of formula units. That is through this application of Avogadro's number. Now, it is this count, okay, that three to one jelly bean to to uh, mint ratio that allows us to do the chemical math, which means we cannot ratio masses, okay? When we're dealing with things in terms of chemical formula, we're not dealing with the masses, we're dealing with the count. So, for example, H2O means that there are two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. Now, when I'm dealing with these formulas, I'm talking about the number of atoms. So I'm not talking about masses. So what I need to do is I need to be able to convert masses to moles. And we do this using the molar mass of an element. That is the mass number given on the periodic table. So to convert to from mass to moles, we use the molar mass. Now if I want to actually get an absolute count of the particles, then I use Avogadro's number. Okay, And we do this because to get the same number of particles, for different masses. So something like hydrogen, which has got a mass unit of 1.01 AMUs, is not the same size as an oxygen, which is 16 AMUs. So in order to get the same count, we can't talk about the same mass. Okay, so 16 grams of hydrogen does not equal the same number of particles as 16 grams of oxygen. Um, so the little flowchart down here mass of the element, if we have the mass of the element, to find the number of moles, we divide by the molar mass, that's what that scripty m is. If we want to go from the number of moles, n, to the mass, then we multiply by molar mass. Okay, so n times m. So if you're going that way, it's n times m. If you're going this way, it's m divided by scripty m. If I want to get a count of atoms, then I'm going to take the mass converted into moles and then multiply by Avogadro's number to get the number of particles. To go backwards, if I've got a number of particles, I'm going to divide by Avogadro's number to get the number of moles, and then multiply by the molar mass to get the mass of the element. Now, in reality, this portion of our uh, little flowchart is rare and only really shows up when we are dealing with uh, standardized tests. Now, since the final is a standardized test, I am telling you how to do this, but it is not a very common practice to go, oh, I wonder how many particles there are. Um, well, it is kind of neat. It is not often used in real life problems. So just to illustrate and, and drive home this point of uh, moles of atoms and the same number of particles of atoms being 
different sizes and these uh, being the same number being a different mass we have one mole of several different substances we've got one mole of carbon which has a mass of 12.01 grams okay one mole of sulfur is 32.06 grams one mole of iron 55.85 copper 63.55 and mercury 200.6 grams each one of these contains the exact same number of atoms Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd but they do not have the same mass so if I want to get a count which I need for my formulas I cannot use mass I must go through the concept of the mole all right, let's do a few practice problems. Um, so the first one, we're going to convert 16.5 grams of sodium to moles. Uh, in the second one, we're going to convert moles to atoms. And in the final one, we're going to go from atoms to grams, so the full spectrum. So first step in any problem-solving attempt is we are going to write down what we know. So for the first one, we've got 16.5 grams of sodium, and we want to find the number of moles. Okay, so to go from grams to moles, I'm going to use molar mass. So 16.5 grams of sodium. I'm going to set this up just like a dimensional analysis problem, just like normal. So I'm going to multiply by, now, what is my conversion factor? I need to cancel out grams of sodium. I want moles of sodium. So one mole of sodium is how many grams of sodium? Well, if I take a look at the periodic table, uh, it is... Uh, 22.9 if I remember correctly after double checking my periodic table 22.99 grams of sodium so when I do this division I get I get 0 0.718 to three significant figures and moles of sodium do not forget to put your unit and your identity because as you're going to see when we are doing stoichiometric problems, we're going to often change identities of elements. So make sure you write down what you have, the unit, mole, and the substance, sodium. So for the second problem, we are going to convert 1.5 moles of lithium into the number of atoms. Okay, so this time I'm going from moles to an account of particles, so I'm going to use Avogadro's number. So I'm going to write this down, 1.5 lithium uh, moles. I really should write moles of lithium first. So 1.5 moles of lithium times, now, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. And when I do this, I get 9.0 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of lithium. Our final example, we are going to turn 1.2 times 10 to the 24th atoms of iron into grams. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do is we've got to take the 1.2 times 10 to the 24th atoms and we need to convert that to moles, so atoms of iron. So one mole of iron is going to contain Avogadro's number of uh, atoms of iron, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron, okay? Times, now to get to the mass, we've got to have moles cancel, so one mole of Fe, one mole of Fe, is 55.85 grams of Fe. And when we do this calculation, we see that we have 111.3289 grams of iron, but we've got two sig figs here. So really, we want to convert our answer to having two sig figs. So we're going to get rid of that. We're going to write 111 as the two sig figs becomes 110 grams of iron. Alright, so far we've talked about the concept of the mole in terms of atoms, 
Um, but we can do it in terms of molecules or ions or uh, whatever we want, really. Um, now, so in order to do start dealing with compounds, however, we need to talk about how do we determine the molar mass of a compound. So I've got several different terminology here, and they really actually come out to the same thing. We've got the formula mass. Now, the formula mass is what we find for ionic compounds. We actually don't call it a molar mass. We call it a formula mass. And all this is is the sum of all the atoms in the formula in a terms of atomic mass units. Okay, So that's not dealing with moles. Okay, Then we have the molecular mass. Molecular mass is for molecular compounds, molecules, things that are nonmetal to nonmetal. This is the sum of all the atoms in the formula in terms of AMUs. So formula mass, molecular mass, we're talking about AMUs. When we say molar mass, it is every compound molecular or uh, ionic in terms of grams per mole. Okay, so the molar mass is actually the most useful. However, they're all mathematically identical. What you do is you just take up uh, all of the masses from the periodic table and you sum them together. So for example, for H2O, you take two hydrogen at 1.08 uh, grams plus one oxygen at 15.99 grams and you add that all together. For sodium chloride, you take one sodium, one chlorine, 22.99 grams for sodium and 35.45 grams for chlorine, and you get 58.44 grams per mole. These would be the exact same in AMUs if they were molecular mass for the water and formula mass for the sodium chloride. Identically, mathematically, okay? Uh, identically, mathematically identical, that's what I want to say. It's exactly the same. You just sum up all the masses, okay? The units are the only thing that changes. If you want AMUs, throw AMUs on the unit. If you want grams per mole, write grams per mole. Now what is the utility of the molar mass? The molar mass is going to be used as a conversion factor, okay? Just like all the other conversion factors we learned in chapter one, it is used to get into moles. We have to get into moles because we cannot simply ratio the number of, uh, ratio the masses because atoms are different masses. Remember the moly, 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 moly slide? Uh, so molar mass is our conversion factor. So it's a conversion factor that you have to make each time. It's not one that you can just memorize all the conversion factors possible and apply the one you want. This is something you make. All right, so I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about how we get formulas from experimental data. Okay? And that is the concept of percent composition and empirical formula. The percent composition is simply the ratio of the masses of an element in a compound to the sum total of the masses. An easy way to say this is it's the part over the whole. So for example, if I wanted to do the mass percent of water, I would take the mass of the two hydrogens over the sum total for the mass of the water. So 2 over 18. Um, if I wanted the oxygen, it would be 16 over 18. Okay, So that's just the percent composition. Um, just a part over a whole, just how you always do percents. Um, now, what's nice about percent composition is we can actually determine that experimentally quite easily. And you've actually already seen that in the lab. Now, we can use percent composition to help to determine the empirical or the simplest formula of a compound. Okay. Now, the way we do this is uh, kind of cool, uh, but it relies on us to use the concept of the mole. We actually have done this again in the lab already. Remember when we were determining the waters of hydration? That number is actually part of the empirical formula. So let's do a percent composition problem uh, and we're going to determine the percent composition of the elements in ethanol. Uh, CH3CH2OH or sometimes written as C2H6O or is this funny looking dog-like molecule there? So let's determine the mass percents uh, or the percent composition for each element. Okay, so I'm going to start with my formula, C2H6O. I know I've got two carbons, so two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. So I'm going to find the sum total, the molar mass of this. So I've got two times 12.01 for carbon. I've got six times 1.008 
and I've got 1 times 15.999. When I add this up, I get 46.07 grams per mole. Okay. Now to determine the percent, I'm going to take each of the mass of the elements and divide by the whole. So I've got the 2 for carbon, 2 times 12.01 is 24.02. I'm going to divide that by the sum total of the mass, 46.07, and multiply it by 100 to turn that into a percentage. So 24.02 divided by 46.07 gives us 0 0.5. Two, one, four. Uh, sorry, fifty-two point one four percent. I forgot to multiply by my one hundred, so fifty-two point one four percent. To deal with the hydrogen, I've got my six hydrogen times one point zero zero eight. So six times one point zero zero eight gives me six. 0.048 divided by the 46.07 times 100, I get 13.13%. To deal with the oxygen, come over here, the oxygen, I've got one of these at 15.999 divided by the 46.07. So 15.999 divided by 46.07 gives me 34.73%. Now if I did this right, all my percentages should add up to about 100. And they do. Maybe sometimes when you're doing this you may end up with slightly more than 100 or slightly less than 100. That has to do with your sig figs and what you're counting uh, in terms of your molar mass. So that's how we do a percent composition. Now we can use this percent composition information to work backwards to find formulas. And the way we do that is we take the mass percent and we pretend we have 100 grams of the sample. That means that if I assume I have 100 grams of the sample, each percentage is then a mass. So then I can take each of the masses of the elements and convert them to moles of the elements. Now, moles, remember, gives us a count. That means I can take the count and ratio the count. When I ratio the count, I get the subscripts of the empirical formula. Okay? So it's actually pretty easy. So, assume 100 grams, convert masses to moles, and ratio the moles of the elements. So let's do an example. Ascorbic acid, vitamin C, cures scurvy. It is composed of 40.92% carbon, 4.58% hydrogen, and 54.50% oxygen by mass. And then we want us to determine its empirical formula. So, okay, so we've written down what we know. 40.92% carbon, 4.58% hydrogen, and 54.5% oxygen. So I'm going to assume 100 grams of sample. That means that I now have 40.92 grams of carbon, 4.58 grams of hydrogen, and 54.50 grams of oxygen. So I'm going to take my grams, I've assumed 100 grams, I'm going to take my grams now and convert to moles. So the way we do that is using the molar mass. So one mole of carbon is 12.01 grams of carbon. 4.58 grams of hydrogen times one mole of hydrogen is I'm going to actually use 1.01. I'm going to I'm going to there's a reason why I'm going to do this. Um, you can be a little bit lenient when determining empirical formulas with your molar masses uh, because of the error involved in the actual uh, experiments. You usually get a little bit better answer if you're if you're not using like 15,000 sig figs, okay? Um, so then when we come to oxygen, one mole of oxygen is 15.999 grams of oxygen. I forgot to put my grams of hydrogen there. And let's see what happens when I do all these calculations. 
All right, so after doing these calculations, we get 3.407 moles of carbon, 4.53 moles of hydrogen, and 3.406 moles of oxygen. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ratio all of these numbers of moles by the smallest number. So 30, uh, 3.406 moles uh, is the smallest number, so I'm going to take everything and divide by 3.406 moles. 3.406 and 3.406. So a number divided by itself is 1. 3.407 divided by 3.406 is so close to 1. And 4.53 divided by 3.406 is equal to 1.33. <clears throat> now there's a problem here. These numbers need to be integers. Now that 3.33 is 33%. That's a pretty large number. So what I need to do is find a factor that will get rid of the 33, the 0.33 there. And what I'm going to do is to get rid of the 0.33, turn that into an integer, I'm going to multiply everything by 3. So 3 times 1 gives me 3, 3 times 1 gives me 3, and 3 times 1.33 gives me 4. These are now the numbers that are going to be the integer subscripts for our empirical formula. So our final answer should be C3H4O3. So you've done empirical formulas, you've done the mass percents, uh, and we've talked about what the mole is and how to do conversions. This is where the material for exam three ends. So exam three, or exam one, sorry, exam one material ends here.